You got your Bibles? You ready for God's Word this morning? Turn to your neighbor and say to your neighbor, God wants to speak to you this morning. God wants to speak to you. Amen. It's good to be together here. You know, last week we started with a question, how big is your God? Remember that? How big is your God? And we tried to explain that as best we could. I think it's a tough one, but I think we walked out of here just knowing that Wow, God is awesome. God is bigger than I could ever imagine. And when we have the right perspective of God, what happens? It changes our spiritual life. It changes our prayers and everything. Today I want to start with this question, how loving is your God? Do you have a mean, angry God? Do you have a distant God? How, how loving is your God? Well, Jesus tried to explain this. And he tells the story of the prodigal son. Remember those three stories go together. It's the lost son, the lost coin, the lost sheep. And really the reason for that is to try and explain what God is like. When we look at that, that story, you and I are the prodigal son. The father is our heavenly father. And so I think Jesus had a, had a sense of humor as he was telling this. Because he basically tells the story of a Jewish boy amongst the pigs. And he couldn't go any lower, any more humiliating than sitting amongst the pigs. And right there in that utterly low position, he comes to his senses. And he decides to go home, to go and apologize to his father. We know this story. And so he comes up with this, with this uh, speech. He starts rehearsing it. And it sounds something like this. He says, Father, I've sinned against heaven and against you. Now, I don't know about you, but if one of my kids had to walk in and they, they rehearse something like that, I would like, I've sinned against heaven and against you. Like, did you murder anybody? What, you know, what have you done? I mean, my daughter just this week borrowed Liesl's car and went through a pothole and wrecked the tire and she came home and she didn't say, Dad, you know, I've sinned against you and against mom's little mini. <laughs> no, she just said, Dad, I'm sorry. You know, it's like, I've, I, think, I think it's wrecked, you know. I know you put, put a new one on just last week, you know. <laughs> and so he comes home and he says to his dad, he says, I've sinned against heaven and against you. And, he, and then he says, and I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. He says, if you can just make me one of the servants, I'll, I'll, I'll be so happy. Why would he do that? <laughs> because you see, he didn't believe he deserved the Father's goodness. And so often you and I walk around with exactly that. We don't believe God should be good to us or, or even God can be good to us. Because maybe in a moment of foolishness, we did something really stupid that we are so ashamed of uh, and, 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 you know, we can't believe we've done it. Or maybe we went and did the same thing that we've done a thousand times and we've promised God and we've promised ourselves we'll never do that again. And, and we went and we, 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 we did that again. And when those things happen, guess what? We don't feel we deserve His goodness and, and, and His kindness because we've just messed up again. And guess who loves it when we feel like that? The enemy, the devil, Satan. Because the Bible calls him the accuser of the brethren. So he goes and accuses God's children all the time. That's what he does. It's one of his favorite pastimes. Just to come and remind you and me of our past and our mistakes and all the stuff that we've done wrong. Because as long as we dwell on those things... Guess what happens? There's distance between us and God. We, we just don't feel good enough. And so guilt and failure are the two most favorite tools that he uses against you and me. Do you know that you can come before God and you can ask God for forgiveness? And you can be so sincere about it. And you can walk away and still feel guilty and still feel bad about that thing. You can turn your back on your old life, and, and walk away from that, and still don't feel good enough, still not embrace your new life. 
You see, you'll never embrace your new life fully until you embrace the forgiveness for your old life. You and I have got to realize that when we've messed up and we've all messed up, when we ask for forgiveness and God forgives us, we've got to embrace that forgiveness. You will never fully embrace the new life until you embrace the forgiveness for the old life. You see, when God forgives you and me, He doesn't do what people do. You see, with with people, they'll say to us, okay, I forgive you, but you better not do it again. Well, I forgive you, but but don't think I'm going to forget it. (laughs) Or they'll even say to you, I'll forgive you, but you owe me. Or if they don't say it, some people don't say it. But they certainly, you can see it through their attitude. Because every now and again, they'll remind you, of what you've done, and, and, and the fact that you still owe them for that. God doesn't do that. Because when God forgives, the Bible says He removes it as far as the east is from the west. It's, it's gone. And it also says He remembers it no more. And so God doesn't do what people do. God doesn't remind us. God doesn't come and bring it up again and again. That's why Jesus died. Jesus died for people who failed. Because there aren't any other type around. There aren't any other type around. There's nobody here, including this guy on stage, who can say, man, I've never failed. I've never done so. We all need it. The Bible says, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. All right? Now, here's something that may mess with your mind for a moment. But before you just chuck it out, I want you to just think about this. Just Just think about this. Do you know that you cannot disappoint God? That's right. You cannot disappoint God. Why? What is disappointment? Well, disappointment is the gap between the expectation and the reality. So when you and I are disappointed, it's because we had a certain expectation. I thought He was going to do that. Oh, I was expecting them to do this, or at least they should have, all right? And that's where disappointment comes in. And that's why this prodigal son, this young man, that's why he prepares the speech, because there was disappointment. There was he had a certain expectation, and it wasn't met. And in his mind, his father had the same expectation. But you see, that's the thing that you and I've got to see, that you cannot disappoint God. Because the Bible tells us that He knows the end from the beginning. So in other words, God already knows what you and I are going to do, or what we're going to say, or what we're not going to. He knows the end from the beginning, or already knows it today. And so you, you can't, it's impossible to disappoint God. The Bible also says, that his love endures forever. Doesn't matter what you've done. Doesn't matter what you haven't done. His love endures. And do you know that that scripture, I've given you one reference. Do you know that that scripture comes up again and again and again in scripture? Uh, God, God uses different authors to put it in different books in, in the Bible. Why? I think it's because if if you miss it in this book, you're going to find it in that book. And if you miss it there, you're going to find it there. God puts it in again and again and again. His love endures. His love endures because God wants us to know how much He loves us and that we cannot disappoint Him. And it doesn't, doesn't matter what we've done or what we haven't done. You and I can't do anything that will cause God to love us anymore or any less. So in other words, God's love is not conditional. Our love is. If somebody does this or doesn't do that, then then I may not love them anymore. God doesn't operate like that. And that's what blows our, our, our mind. That's why we battle to understand it, that God's love is not conditional. Even if you and I decide to renounce our faith and to curse God, and to turn our backs, and to walk straight to hell. I believe, this is what I believe, 
that God's love will follow us all the way right to the gates of hell. Because Scripture says, His love endures forever. That's the God whom we serve, and that's why it's so amazing. And it's this love that the older brother didn't get. He just didn't understand it. And the younger brother didn't get it. He didn't understand it. Why? I think it's because they didn't really know the Father. Because if they knew their Father, they would have known. He's forgiven. He, he, he forgives. You know, he'll, he'll, he'll give me another chance. They didn't know the Father. And so here's the takeaway for today. God's love is not earned or deserved. It's freely given. You and I cannot earn God's love. There's nothing more that you can do or not do to deserve God's love. It's freely given. Jesus says in Matthew chapter 10, He says, Freely I have given. You've received. Now freely give. So in other words, you've received love. Give love to those around. You've received forgiveness. He says, now give forgiveness. You've received grace. He says, now give grace. Freely you've received. Freely give. You see, if you and I don't have the right image of God on the inside, we're not going to have the right relationship with God. And so some people, when they think of God, they see God as, as this being out there. He's distant. He's far away. They'll refer to him as, as, as the man upstairs. Other people see God in a, in a very formal way, almost like the, like the Old Testament uh, 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 people. You know, he's, uh, they, they've got a very uh, a reverential fear for God. And, and it's not wrong, but it's, it's one way to see God. You know, uh, God is, 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 is this, this very strict being. Some people even see God as an enforcer. They see the Bible as a book of rules and regulations. And, and so God's just waiting for you to break one of those rules. And, and He's going to zap you. I think the right image for you and me, the right picture that you and I need to have, according to the Bible, is of a loving Heavenly Father. None of that other stuff. A loving Heavenly Father. Somebody who's there to help us, help us when we make mistakes, to help us achieve everything that He has for us, somebody who will, who will cheer us on, uh, somebody who really believes in us. God says, I've got good plans for you, to bless you and prosper you, not to harm you. That's the God that we serve, you know. He, he believes in us. And so I think for many people, they, they see God as, as their Savior, and that's good. But when you start seeing Him as your loving Heavenly Father, Everything changes. It transforms your relationship with Him. Now, maybe you've grown up in a home where you didn't have a loving father. Maybe, maybe you didn't have a father at home. Or maybe you had a father and, and, and he was distant. Or maybe you had somebody who was mean and harsh and, and, and impossible to please. I, I don't know. But if that was the case, just be careful. That, that that image that you have of an earthly father, that, that it doesn't taint the image of your heavenly father, that you don't project that onto your heavenly father. I think our frame of reference for the term father is often loaded with baggage from what we've experienced on this earth. And so if, if, if you have baggage, if, if you don't have a good image you, you've got to switch between your earthly father and your heavenly father. Because Jesus, when he gives us the Lord's Prayer, what does he tell us to do? He says, pray, our Father, which art in heaven. You know what he's saying? You've got to switch. You, you've got to switch from this realm to that realm. You, you've got to look beyond your earthly father, beyond all his mistakes. And, and let me just add in here, no father is perfect, by the way. So if you didn't have a perfect father, join the club. So have probably all of us. So no, no father is perfect. And you've got to look beyond that when you look to your, your heavenly father. So how do we know what God is like? 
if you didn't have a, a good father, if you don't have a good image of, of, of a father, how do we know? You've got to go back to Scripture. Remember what we said last week. God reveals Himself to us through Scripture. God uses us. One of the reasons God has given us Scripture is to reveal Himself. And so you can't really know God if you don't know some of this. We'll never know everything, but you've got to know some of this. And so one of the best places to start is just go to the four Gospels and just look at the life of Jesus. Because Jesus says, anyone who has seen me, seen the Father. So he says, you look at my life, you'll have a pretty good idea of what our Heavenly Father is like. And when, when you and I start looking at Jesus' life, you know what I see? I see somebody who's, who's caring, loving, compassionate. He helps. He heals. He's got grace for people. It's just, just amazing. The Bible says, a bruised reed he will not break. Talking about Jesus. What does that mean? Well, when you're down, he's not going to kick you. As a matter of fact, the Bible says in Psalm 46, he says he's an ever-present help in times of trouble. So when you go through a tough time, when there's hardships in your life, <laughs> he's not going to kick you when you're down. He's there to help you. He's there in, in, in times of, of trouble. And so you and I have got to look at, at, at the life of, of Jesus, and we've got a pretty good idea of what God is like. I shared this amazing truth with you last week. If, if for those of you who were here, the fact that God loves you, listen to this, God loves you and me as much as He loves Jesus. I don't know about you, but, but, but that blows my mind. I, I, I know God loves me. He sent Jesus to die for me. Uh, scripture says, if he sent Jesus, won't he freely with him give us all things? So in other words, if he's done that, you better know he'll do almost anything for you. That's what Scripture says. So that's how much God loves us. But when I discovered some years ago that he loves me as much as he loves Jesus, I I'm telling you, that just blew my mind. You know, I, I, how's that possible? And so if you weren't here, let me give you the scripture quickly. John 17, 23. And this is Jesus speaking. He says, Then the world will know that you sent me and will understand that you love them as much as you love me. What an astounding thought. It doesn't matter how many times you failed. It doesn't actually matter how selfish you've been, the kind of life you've lived. He still loves us. And the Bible says in, in Jeremiah chapter 31 that he loves us with an everlasting love. So in other words, it's not going to change. That's why we can say it doesn't matter what you've done and not done. He loves us with an everlasting love. Now, I don't know about you, but when God's love first became, really became a reality to me and I started getting just a grasp of it, I didn't want to mess with sin and nonsense in my life anymore. You know, I, I look at God, you've done so much for me, and you love me so much. Somehow, all I want to do is, is just love Him back. Just live a life that will honor Him, and live a life that, that, that will please Him. I don't want to take advantage of, of this love. Now, maybe you're saying today, well, Leonard, you know, I've made so many mistakes. I've done some stuff that I'd hate to be shown up on the screen here. <laughs> Let me whisper to you. That makes two of us. All right? There's some stuff I've done in my life that I'd hate for people to know. I'd hate for others to see. But that doesn't change how God sees me. That doesn't change how much He loves me. You see, when my children blow it, do I love them less? I may not love what they're doing. I may not love their attitude or whatever it is. <laughs> but I still love them very, very much. And our Heavenly Father is even more so. And so if there's one thing that will keep you and me from enjoying His love, is those feelings of guilt. 
things we've done in the past. Sometimes we feel we've got, we've got to somehow pay some penance. You know, somehow I've got to do some good works. You know, I've got to make sure that my good works outweigh my bad works. And I know Jesus has already paid for it, but maybe I can help him. <laughs> you know what we're doing? You know what people, people who do that, you know what they're doing? They're overvaluing their good works. They're undervaluing. That's the scary part, the cross. They're undervaluing the cross. Jesus has done it all. He's paid it all. You and I don't have to add to that. Maybe you're saying, but Leonard, I, I don't know if God can forgive me. Maybe you're walking with feelings like that. Something has happened in your life, and, and you know that He's a God of love. You know that. But I don't know if He can forgive me. I want to share scripture with you that hopefully will set you free today. Listen to what the Bible says. Proverbs 28, you can switch this thing off, France, thanks. People who cover over their sins will not prosper. But if they confess and forsake them, they will receive mercy. What are the two conditions? If they confess and forsake. Those two things. What does that mean? Confessing simply means to come to say, God, I've blown it. God, I've done this. We, we don't come with excuses. We don't try and rationalize it. But, you know, this has happened and nothing of that. We just come, we, we put up our hand. One of the best things we can teach our children, put up your hand when you've done something wrong. Because that helps them to do it with God one day. Don't come with excuses. Just say, I've blown it. I've done this. I shouldn't have. That's what it means to confess. And then what is the second thing that it tells us to do? We need to confess and forsake. Forsake simply means I turn my back. I walk in the opposite direction. You see, it's no use saying, oh, Lord, I'm so sorry I did that. And tomorrow I'll just keep doing it again. No. When we confess, we say, Lord, I've blown it. And I turn. And I walk away from that life. When I forsake it, God says that's when we receive mercy. The Bible says in 1 John 1 verse 9, If we confess our sins, He's faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us. So in other words, He makes us brand new again. But it's got to come from our side. Now again, I'm not saying, I'm not saying God's love is an excuse for you and me. To, to, to mess with sin a little bit and we come and ask for forgiveness and then, and then we mess a little. It's quite the contrary. It's because of His incredible love and the fact that He just keeps loving me that I say, Lord, I, I, I don't want to mess with sin. I, I don't want to go down that road anymore. I want to live for you. I want to honor you. Have you ever wondered, but Leonard, why is it? Why is it that I keep battling with sin? Why is it I keep doing some of the stuff I don't want to do? And it's very simple, really. It's because we keep on focusing on, this, on, on what we want, on our selfishness. So in other words, our lust, our desires, our passions and pleasures and stuff, we, we focus on those things rather than focusing on God. And as, as, long, as long as you and I focus on ourselves and what we want, We'll always end up going after, after sin and selfishness. <laughs> but the moment we turn and we focus on the Lord and what He's done and how, he's good to, been, how good He's been to us, guess what happens? You end up living a life to honor Him and to please Him. And so next time when you're tempted to do the wrong stuff, and we all are, we all go through those, those moments just realize I'm focusing here. I'm focusing on my lust and my pleasure and my thing. Just turn and say, Lord, you've been good to me. And you've loved me and you've always loved me. And you've forgiven me of so much nonsense in the past. And I'm telling you, you spent 30 seconds here. <laughs> you won't want to go there anymore. All right? The Bible says in, in Proverbs 3 verse 6, here's the last scripture for this morning. In everything you do, Put God first, 
put God first. So in other words, don't put yourself first and, and, and your desires. Put God first and He will direct you and crown your efforts with success. So let me wrap it up for us. Why have I shared this with you today? Because it's so important for us to have the correct biblical understanding of God's love. Because when you and I start grasping it, I don't think we'll ever fully grasp it on this earth. We won't. Because our love is very conditional. His love is unconditional. But when we start grasping something of it, guess what happens? It opens our hearts to God. And suddenly it changes our relationship with Him. And, and, and we start enjoying a relationship with God that, that we haven't enjoyed before. And suddenly the stuff that the enemy used to bring up in the past and, and, and used to bring guilt and all of that stuff, foot sack man, you know. <laughs> he loves me because I, he loves me. That stuff is in the past. And so he can't bully me with that stuff anymore. And guess what happens? I don't want to do that stuff anymore. I want to live for him. I want to just live a life to honor him and, and, and to please him. Not because I have to. Because I want to. Because I've experienced a little bit of his love. That's what happens when we start focusing on the God of love. The Bible says he is love. He doesn't have a little bit of love. He is love. Come, let's stand. I want to pray for us. I just, I want us to do something different this morning. I want us to applaud God's love. Can we do that? <laughs> Lord, we don't actually know how to respond to your love. It's difficult to fathom why you love us and that you love us with an everlasting love and, 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 and such an unconditional love. I guess it's because you are love. So we just want to respond to that today. Say thank you. Thank you, Lord. And help us to love you back and to live for you all the days of our lives. Not to live these selfish lives, but just somehow to live for you. We ask this in Jesus' name. And everyone said, Amen. Amen. Bless you.